All right, so we got a bunch of cases, um, and we'll start with our first case. So case number one is a 64-year-old male uh, with a past medical history of hypertension, tobacco use for 40-pack uh, years, uh, presents with fevers, cough, generalized weakness, and some altered mental status. Now, um, this is obviously a very much made up question because nobody travels anymore, but this patient uh, retired about two years ago, I guess right about the start of the COVID, and he went for a, uh, 18 months ago, he went for a safari, and then uh, he also, uh, about six months ago, was on a Caribbean cruise, and obviously nobody goes on cruises anymore, um, but also spent some time up in uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Um, but again, presents, comes in with uh, really these symptoms of fevers, cough, and a little bit of altered mental status. So he's worked up, and this is what his initial chest x-ray shows. And hopefully you all see that there's an abnormality in the right lower lobe. Looks pretty scary. And uh, because of his altered mental status, this is what his uh, brain imaging shows. And again, another kind of scary thing to see. So um, he, it's decided he should undergo bronchoscopy. Um, and uh, bronchoscopy is, is, is performed. And you have a, uh, a nice micro uh, there showing something. So the most likely causative organism is. All right, so you have a bunch of things there. I'll let you a little time to think. Um, but. I think the important thing is, uh, you know, there's a couple of things, you know, about this case that I, I you know, I, I think is important. So first of all, uh, let me just go back. Um, you know, he has this uh, chest x-ray that really, it looks like that right lower lobe, looks like he's got a mass there. So, you know, and clearly with this history of tobacco use, you really have to be concerned about malignancy. And I think doing a bronchoscopy is appropriate. And then of course you can also see uh, met metastatic disease. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it, you know, if you're doing the question, it, you know, during your boards, clearly you're gonna have to think of malignancy too, but then they give you this micro. And my hope is you're able to see uh, some yeast forms there. Um, and actually, uh, the answer is um, an organism that you may or may not have come across yet. Uh, it's Cryptococcus gadii, and I'm going to talk about uh, Cryptococcus first, um, but uh, and then we'll get to gadii in a few minutes. Okay, so this is your classic um, uh, present. Uh, I'm sorry, this is your classic uh, micrograph showing. Um, the uh, ca encapsulated yeast form of Cryptococcus. Um, this is the uh, India ink stain, uh, and it's a very pretty smear here. And you can see nicely that there's a capsule around those yeast. And if we talk a little bit about the microbiology of Cryptococcus, um, there's really three species uh, that you should probably be aware of, really two that you should be aware of, Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gadii. Cryptococcus grubii rarely causes disease, so you don't need to worry about that. I think the important thing to remember for your boards, I think if you see something about India Inc., you, you, they're really talking about cryptococcosis. Now, the other thing I want to point about uh, Cryptococcus is just to remember that it actually, it's a yeast and it actually grows on blood agar. So you don't really need to send off fungal cultures if you're concerned about cryptococcosis. So this will grow from your CSF very nicely within about three days or so. And also it will uh, grow from your blood and you know, patients in particularly, uh, you know, our immunocompromised patient population, including patients with advanced HIV disease can often um, present with cryptococcemia so they can grow directly from their blood. Um, and again, I think the India ink is kind of telling. And I think the other stain, and I th you think if the fellows are on, the ID fellows are on, uh, the music carmine stain also shows uh, this uh, cryptococcosis very nicely in tissue. Okay, so uh, if we're talking about the epidemiology of cryptococcosis, I think um, cryptococcus neoformans, you're all familiar with it being associated with um, you know, bird droppings, pigeon droppings, and uh, uh, bat droppings. Um, but yeah, predominantly, excuse me, bird and uh, pigeon droppings uh, is really the, the one to remember. But um, rarely do we ever get a history that the patient will say, oh, I was exposed to bird droppings. So it's very much in the environment. Clearly, there's a high, higher burden of disease in those settings, but we rarely get that history. And then Cryptococcus gadii is interesting because it's really a uh, another species of uh, Cryptococcus 
um, that was predominantly seen only in uh, Australia and Papua New Guinea, but more recently uh, we've seen it in the Upper Northwest, including places like uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, who gets cryptococcosis? So predominantly uh, Cryptococcus neoformans, and that's what I'm really talking about here right now, is predominantly seen in patients with uh, T cell uh, uh, deficiencies. So that's going to be your advanced HIV patients, uh, you know, patients with CD4 counts uh, less than 200 or even less than 100 will be at risk for Cryptococcus neoformans meningitis. Um, and, and clearly we see this in the US, but also globally in places like um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in, in HIV infected patients, it's a very common cause of meningitis. But we also see it in our transplant patient populations, uh, particularly our solid organ transplant. It's probably the third most common fungal infection seen in solid organ transplant, hematopoietic stem cell transplant patient populations, patients with underlying um, uh, hematologic malignancies, high dose corticosteroids, TNF alpha inhibitors, all of these things drive down T cells. So that's why you're at increased risk. Now, diabetics are also at increased risk. And then um, one that I want you to re be aware of, uh, particularly because we see a lot of these patients, patients with underlying cirrhosis also are at increased risk for getting cryptococcosis. And we've seen a few of these over the years who, who have presented um, with cryptococcosis, just with cirrhosis as really being their only uh, risk factor. Um, and again, uh, just coming back to uh, the whole thing about, uh, you know, cryptococcus neoformans uh, predominantly seen in patients, um, uh, in, in, in uh, immunocompromised patients. And also, uh, again, uh, really there's no true um, exposure, you know, to these pigeon and uh, you know, uh, pigeon droppings or bird droppings, but it's, all, you know, we always hear about that, but really do you ever get that history from your patient? Cryptococcus gadii, it's really something that you need to take a bit of a travel history. Um, again, it was initially seen mostly associated with eucalyptus trees um, in a tropical areas, but really now is spread to other parts um, of the world and, and including places like uh, 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 Vancouver, British Columbia, and then the upper northwest of the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, if we talk about um, uh, cryptococcosis with regard to um, clinical manifestations, let me just go to the next slide. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, I, I want you to kind of look at this picture and, and first and foremost, because this is an important thing to remember for your patients and also for your boards. So you can notice there's this papular lesions that are somewhat umbilicated. And classically in patients with disseminated cryptococcosis, they can develop these umbilicated skin lesions that almost look like molluscum contagiosum. Um, so if you have somebody presenting with, you know, fevers, headache, and then they have these skin lesions, and they're somebody who's immunocompromised, particularly HIV patients, feel, uh, you know, I think you should really be putting um, uh, cryptococcosis at the top of your differential. But basically, we acquire cryptococcosis by inhalation. So you can see pulmonary manifestations of it. So you can get pulmonary nodules, you can get alveolar infiltrates, but usually it loves the CNS. It loves, so we rarely see patients who present with cryptococcal pneumonia. Um, and, and I'll talk about that in particular with GADII. It's a little different. But in cryptococcus neoformans and immunocompromised patients, usually they, they rapidly develop uh, infection in the central nervous system um, and present with men meningitis or meningoencephalitis. And that's really the most common thing to remember. And again, I've already mentioned the skin lesions of molluscum contagiosum or these papular nodule lesions. We've even seen some very unusual skin lesions associated with our uh, solid organ transplant associated with uh, cryptococcosis. Um, these patients, uh, you know, can get um, severe uh, meningitis, which, which results in increased intracranial pressure, resulting in optic neuritis and blindness. Um, so really it could be quite devastating if it's not treated. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to spend a few minutes on this newer um, uh, fungal infection, uh, Cryptococcus gadii. Um, and again, this has been in the ID literature, and I, I don't know how, how much it's made it into the internal medicine literature, but I think it's an important, uh, uh, another important um, 
clinical syndrome you should be able to recognize. So as I said before, Cryptococcus neoformans is typically an immunocompromised host, but C. gadii, on the other hand, more typically affects immunocompetent patients. Okay, so that's what the big difference is. So you could see it in immunocompetent patients. And again, it, there have been clusters and outbreaks. Um, uh, again, a large outbreak uh, in uh, British, uh, Van, um, I'm sorry, Vancouver, Br British Columbia, but also in the upper Northwest, like Washington State, Oregon, Idaho. Um, and then it's made its way into other states like Hawaii, Georgia, California, and Florida. Um, but, but again, it, it, it's, um, it's much less common than Cryptococcus neoformans, but the important thing about it is it's more likely to cause, um, it's more likely to cause disease in immunocompetent patients. And hence, these patients present much differently, much like this patient that we, we, um, we had as our case. So these patients will present with um, crypto, uh, cryptococcal lesions in the, in the lungs that are large pulmonary nodules that can look very much like malignancy. Um, and then they also, rather than present with meningitis, they can present with cryptococcomas, so they can get large CNS lesions. So the, the kind of the difference between cryptococcus gadii, uh, you know, and cryptococcus neoformans that I just want to really, again, mention is that cryptococcus gadii, immunocompetent, more likely to see solitary uh, lung lesions, um, and then also solitary um, CNS lesions. Um, and then this is just um, to give you an example of a CT in a patient with cryptococcus gadii. Yeah. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to mention, and I think this has come up um, on the boards, and I think is 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 a good thing to know, is you know how do you treat cryptococcosis? How do you treat cryptococcal meningitis? And the most data we have on this is in patients um, with HIV AIDS. Um, so there's a lot of clinical trials out there on how to treat it. And really the guidelines now are as follows. And I think, you know, this is a, a, good, this is a good thing to remember for your boards because I've seen some mix up questions um, and board related questions on this. So, you know, they give you a patient with HIV AIDS and they ask you how to manage it. And um, there's a couple of important nuances to remember. So number one, you need to treat these patients with ambisome, uh, a lipid preparation of amphotericin B with 5-FC or 5-flucytosine. And usually they recommend about two weeks. And where do we come up with two weeks? Well, it turns out that the combination of ambisome and 5-flucytosine compared to ambisome alone or amphotericin alone or fluconazole, I mean, they've looked at a lot of different combinations and things like that. It turns out that this is the most rapid way to sterilization of your CNS cultures. So um, it's anticipated that you're going to treat for about two weeks with ambisome plus 5-FC. Um, secondly, um, after you give, you've sterilized them, then you can um, de-escalate them to oral uh, fluconazole and anywhere from 400 milligrams a day to 800 milligrams a day. And that's usually recommended for about 10 weeks. And then after 10 weeks, um, you can uh, de-escalate them further uh, to 200 milligrams a day of fluconazole. Now, in HIV patients, it's recommended that you give at least one year of the um, maintenance dosing, um, not the consolidation therapy, the maintenance dosing, so the lower dose fluconazole, for about one year, or and, and you would anticipate that your CD4 count will be greater than 100 and an undetectable viral load. If that's not achieved at that time, you need to maintain your fluconazole. Um, finally, um, when do you start antiretroviral therapy? So it turns out that cryptococcosis, um, starting antiretroviral therapy early on, um, and that would be like less than four weeks or so after start of, of, of antifungal treatment, you can uh, precipitate um, uh, iris or immune, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So it's recommended to wait a while before you start your antiretroviral therapy. And, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's somewhat controversial. And I'm just going to say um, probably waiting about like 10 weeks is probably appropriate before initiation of uh, antiretroviral therapy. Now, the last point I want to make um, in terms of your acute management that is very important, I'm sorry I skipped over it, is I want to go over um, the fact that when you initially uh, evaluated somebody with cryptococcal meningitis, 
There's a, a very nice, uh, you know, controlled clinical trial where they did serial LPs versus no serial LPs plus antifungal therapy. So if you do serial LPs, um, you, you know, you uh, in patients with cryptococcus who present with increased intracranial pressure, actually the neurologic uh, outcomes are much, much better. So the other point, so if you get a question, um, on your boards, and it said, and they say, you know, patient, and you know, is diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis, and they say the most appropriate therapy yeah. is, you want to make sure you answer um, ambisome plus 5-FC uh, plus serial LPs to reduce intracranial pressure. So you want to try to get your pressure less than 20, and so um, basically, uh, you need to be very uh, aggressive about your intracranial pressure and the management of that when you're treating um, uh, cryptococcosis. All right, uh, let's go to our, uh, our next case. Um, uh, so uh, case number two, um, this is a 40-year-old male with a recent diagnosis of HIV. He's not quite on therapy yet. He has a CD4 count of 75 and a uh, viral load um, that is, uh, you know, reasonably high, uh, you know, 80 to 100,000. Definitely in need of antiretroviral uh, therapy. But um, he presents uh, with new onset of um, fevers, uh, some headaches, some somnolence, um, and uh, you know, and and he comes to uh, the ED, and he's noted uh, to have uh, low-grade fevers. Uh, vital signs are relatively stable. Complaining of of headache and is somewhat somnolent, and ultimately. Hey, I'm just wondering, somebody has, if somebody could mute themselves, uh, I, we kind of hear a lot of background noise. I would appreciate that. Um, so th this uh, patient, um, you know, uh, uh, winds up getting an LP. His CT scan is negative, so he goes for an LP. And his LP reveals about 175 WBCs. Um, notice that he has a low number of uh, neutrophils. Um, um, predominantly a mononuclear, uh, mononuclear um, uh, cell infiltrate, and then also he has about 15% eosinophils. He has low glucose at 70 uh, at 35, um, and a high total protein. Now, um, uh, it's also noted that the cryptococcal antigen uh, is negative, and um, the patient also is a contractor, a housing contractor in um, in Arizona. Okay, so. All right, so um, uh, based on that information, um, what is the most likely causative organism? So if, again, if we go back, I want you to kind of focus on one thing. Uh, so obviously he's got advanced HIV disease, um, you know, and there's a, there's a couple of other things in the question stem that are really uh, somewhat telling. And I think what, the one that I want you to just look at is, notice that there are eosinophils in the CSF. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I want you to focus on that. And then clearly, um, there's a little bit of uh, an endemic hint for us there, too. Uh, so the most likely causative organism is going to be coccidioides posidaci. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, coxi. All right. So uh, coccidioides, uh, 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 so coxi um, is actually one of our endemic, uh, one of our endemic um, mycoses. Um, and uh, clearly, um has, it actually has two etiologies. I think most of you are familiar with coccidioides imidis, but there's also um, coccidioides uh, posidaci. Um, and again, this is really a disease we rarely see here in the United States. I'm sorry, in, 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 in the DC area, uh, because we don't really have an endemicity uh, region here, but uh, really it's uh, predominantly in South Central uh, United States. Um, and, and again, this is just to show um, the most common areas. And not only is it in South Central United, I'm sorry, Southwestern United States, excuse me. Not only is it in places like, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, but and California, but it also extends well into uh, Mexico and even Central America too. So, uh, so coccidioides, you know, is quite endemic from South uh, Western United States into Mexico and Central America too. Okay, um, 
coming back to the uh, the two species, so Coccidioides imidis is predominantly seen in Southern California, and Coccidioides posidaceae is predominantly seen in uh, Southwestern United States, all right? That being said, both of these species behave identically. There's really not much difference in terms of their clinical uh, presentation, okay? Uh, let me see, oops, excuse me. Okay, so in terms of um, coccidioidea mycosis, in terms of the, the acute manifestation, um, remember about 60% of people uh, living in endemic areas who are exposed are totally asymptomatic. About 40% are symptomatic, and these patients will usually present with a viral-like syndrome, like fevers, cough, um, uh, maybe chest pain, um, maybe some shortness of breath. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as valley fever, okay? Um, and their chest x-rays um, and their um, uh, pulmonary manifestations can be quite, um, uh, you know, quite variable. Um, they can present with alveolar infiltrates. They can present with pulmonary nodules. Um, they can present with more diffuse uh, appearance on their chest x-ray. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Um, but they also, there's, there also can be some immunologic manifestations. Patients presenting acutely with, uh, with, with coxie can actually present also with uh, emultiforme and erythema nodosum. Um, so that's just another little uh, diagnostic clue to think about sometimes. Um, uh, you, know, and I, I, you know, and there's many things that can cause enodosum, but I, you know, coxie is also one of them. Um, and this is just to give you an example of kind of the varied uh, uh, chest x-ray manifestations that you can see with Coxi. Um, and then this one is actually interesting. This is a CT scan. It almost shows like a bit of a miliary pattern too. So there's multiple ways in which Coxi can present uh, with regard to its acute uh, presentation. Now, um, I think the more important thing that uh, I want to kind of focus on now is how Coxy presents in its disseminated format. Um, and so I think, uh, and this is probably more likely the way they would give you Coxy on, on, on a board exam. Uh, but remember, like uh, cryptococcosis, um, Coxy also depends upon intact cell mediated immunity. And therefore, patients with advanced HIV or AIDS will be at very high risk of getting disseminated infection, as are our solid and stem cell transplant patients, patients, again, hematologic malignancies, patients on chemotherapy, high dose uh, corticosteroids, uh, clearly higher risk. TNF alpha inhibitors is another big one that's been reported uh, more recently. Um, so drugs like uh, adalimumab uh, and fliximab, you need to be concerned about uh, dissemination of COXI. Uh, pregnancy, actually, so women who are in their third term, they have um, a relative depressed uh, cell-mediated uh, immunity, and therefore, uh, they're at increased risk for disseminated uh, coccidioidomycosis. And COXI can disseminate um, to the skin and, and produce these really ugly uh, verrucous-like skin lesions. Um, so about 8% of patients who get coccidioidomycosis will go on to develop dissemination. And um, its typical dissemination is actually to the skin um, and to the bones and joints and then to the meninges. Those are your big things that it disseminates to. Um, and, and, um, and, and I'll just tell you, we had... Um, about a few years ago, we had a, uh, a patient who was, I, I'll never forget, it was right during the Christmas holiday. I was rounding um, during the Christmas holiday, and uh, uh, a 32-year-old woman who was actually a congressional staffer for a patient, uh, for uh, a um, congresswoman uh, from Arizona, um, she actually, uh, the patient presented with a new pleural effusion and severe um, rib and um, actually tibial pain. And uh, she was actually seen in an outside institution, and they thought she had sarcoid, and they put her on high dose steroids. Um, and then she, and, and you know, and, and the reason why she had some, um, she had some hyalur lymphadenopathy, and they said, oh, we think you have sarcoid. They put her on high dose steroids, and then you know, she just came in with these horrible pleural effusions and these kind of diffuse bony pain. And she turned out um, it, initially it was thought, well, maybe she had a malignancy, but it turned out she had coxie, and she grew coxie from. Uh, her ribs, and then from a uh, tibial lesion also. Um, and again, it was from the steroids that she received. So again, causing severe bone and joint uh, disease uh, too. Um, 
but anyway, uh, uh, coxy, um, it, it, it cannot go on to, co to cause uh, meningitis. And in patients who develop meningitis, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things to remember, like how would you, when would you think about it? So first and foremost, it's going to be somebody who's immunocompromised, again, like somebody with advanced HIV disease or, uh, or a patient who's received a TNF-alpha inhibitor or something like that. Um, again, they can present with fevers, headache, you know, the usual, and they often will have a basal or meningitis. Um, the thing that I wanted to point out in the question stem, and I think I did already, but I'm just going to mention it again, that's, that I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you see eosinophils, on your boards in, in CSF, think about coxy because it's one of the most common causes of eosinophilic meningitis. Okay, now there's a, there's a couple of parasites that the ID uh, uh, team needs to know about like Angiostrongylus cantonensis, but for uh, a patient, you know, who's in, you know, from, you know, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, who's immunocompromised, EOs in the CSF, it's gotta be, it's definitely gonna be coxy. Okay, so again, just remember about those the EOs. Now, in terms of making your diagnosis, it's one of those ones like um, crypto. Um, uh, we rely heavily on um, serology. So we usually, for crypto, we think about ordering a cryptococcal antigen. For COXI, you want to send off uh, a, a COXI uh, complement fixation antibody. So we have to send off antibodies. Um, it turns out that our yield for, for uh, isolating COXI from the CSF is quite low. So I would, uh, you know, again, I would favor that you want to make sure you get uh, send off serology. Okay, let's move on. All right. Um, okay, and okay, and then in terms of uh, in the diagnosis, clearly, um, if it's in the lung, you can bronch them and culture it from the lung. Um, but also, uh, you know, you can culture from uh, bone and joint fluid. But also, you can obtain coxy serology. Um, and higher coxy serology, usually one to 16, often connotes that there's probably a likely dissemination. So you can send off the complement fixation serology in the blood to make a diagnosis. Um, and then uh, treatment, uh, patients who are asymptomatic, we usually don't treat, but somebody who's immunocompromised, uh, who presents with coxy, you may want to give them either ambisome or you might want to treat them with fluconazole. And clearly if they have CNS disease, um, uh, usually ambisome or actually fluconazole for prolonged periods of time is required, usually lifelong when they develop it. But I don't think you need to know how to treat coxy. I think really more being able to understand the clinical manifestations is more important. The rest is really for the ID team. Okay, let's go to case number three. So case number three is a 45-year-old male um, who presents, uh, he has known history of uh, Crohn's disease, who presents to the ED with about two weeks of fevers, night sweats, and weight loss. The patient has been on adalimumab for about eight weeks with a reasonably good control of his Crohn's disease. He's originally from Indiana, uh, but has moved here recently and is now somebody who he's taken on a new contract in um, uh, bo both in um, demolition and excavation. So um, it, he presents to the ED and you could see his vital signs there. This patient is quite ill. Um, he's February 39. He is hypotensive, tachycardic, um, and he has uh, lots of lab abnormalities, um, including um, including uh, some uh, pancytopenia. Um, he also has some uh, interstitial um, uh, abnormalities on his chest x-ray too. Okay, another thing on physical exam is he also has oral ulcers and I'll come back to that in a little while. But I'm gonna uh, ask you, um, here's your question. What's the most likely causative organism? All right. So people are thinking, 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 and you're all absolutely right. Of course, this is histoplasma capsulatum. Good job. All right, so this is histo, but let's just step back for a second. Like what place this guy at risk for histo? Now, all of you are very good. You, you know, we're, we're, you know, at our center, we see a fair number of patients uh, who have both uh, rheumatologic diseases as well as inflammatory bowel disease. And they're on a lot of these TNF alpha inhibitors. And you're all familiar that if you start a TNF alpha inhibitor, you need to uh, obtain an IGRA. And I forgot to mention this, I skipped over it in the, the, the uh, question stem that the patient did have a neg negative IGRA at baseline. So you all know to screen for TB. Um, 
But what you might not recognize is that there are also, um, it, you also need to think about patients who come from endemic areas. Um, and there have been um, disseminated cases of endemic mycoses associated with TNF alpha inhibitors. And this is actually a black box warning. Um, in if you look at any of the like adalimumab and fliximab, if you look at any of them, you'll see that there's a black box warning about endemic mycoses, including things like disseminated histo, disseminated coccidioidomycosis, which we just talked about, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, uh, the, the other thing, uh, I, you know, and even if you um, look, on, if you're watching cable or even on, you know, you, you know you're on, on the internet, um, you'll see um, advertisements or you know, commercials for, you know, some of these drugs. And one of the things they say, caution, tell your doctor if you're from an, you know, an area where there's endemic uh, fu fungal in disease. So they even you know, even in commercials, they highlight this. So it's really important to recognize that patients with TNF-alpha inhibitors have markedly depressed T-cell inhibition. And I have a list of all the pathogens, not only fungal pathogens, but also, as you notice, there's uh, listeria has been reported, as well as pneumocystis. So they put, they really do suppress T-cells. So you should be aware of some of the infections associated with this. Okay, but let's move on to histoplasmosis. So histoplasmosis is another uh, endemic mycosis. It's caused by histoplasma capsulatum. Um, and again, this is one of those ones associated with chicken droppings, bird droppings, uh, bat droppings. And really it can, um, it can be seen in rural uh, farming areas, but also it can be seen in urban areas too. Um, and again, in terms of the epidemiology, um, I think all of you are familiar that histo is very common um, in the Ohio Mississippi River Valley. And I think clearly if they say Ohio Mississippi River Valley um, on your boards, uh, probably more for the, uh, for the students, um, then you should be thinking about histo. But I think also you need to know your geography because they may not tell you it's the Ohio Mississippi River Valley. You have to know the states that border that area. Um, and so it's pre predominantly the east central part of the United States. But also there are uh, clusters and there have been, um, you know, places like, um, you know, uh, the St. Lawrence Valley in upstate New York um, and even the Caribbean, um, there's a fair amount of histo uh, there too. So again, it's not only going to be the Ohio Mississippi River Valley. And I will also say that we see a fair amount of histo here, um, you know, in the DC area. And, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later uh, in a second, but I just want to kind of get an idea of, you know, the kind of um, demographics or uh, epidemiology. And again, here, this is showing you kind of where it is in the United States, just give you uh, uh, a better, and the Ohio Mississippi River Valley is highly endemic for this. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so clearly uh, they see a lot of histo there, but, you know, again, we see it here into the east too. Um, uh, like, uh, uh, like coxie, histo, uh, for most patients, 90% of patients are going to be asymptomatic. When they do present, they can present with, you know, again, feverish cough, uh, chest pain, um, uh, pleuritic chest pain. Um, but usually, you know, the majority of people who uh, get uh, exposed to histo, you know, will have a self-limited illness. Um, uh, with high inoculums, you can get, you know, severe disease, um, but most patients will be able to tolerate it. Now, um, again, just like uh, coxie, this is another one uh, it, it, to, to just remember in the back of your mind that histo, acute histo, can also present with uh, emultiformity and enodosum. Now, when it disseminates, you have some abnormal uh, findings with uh, dissemination. Um, and one of the abnormalities with histo dissemination that's very unique to histo is you can get oral ulcers. And I mentioned that in this uh, question stem that this patient also had oral ulcers. So who gets disseminated histo? Again, it's your patients with suppressed T cell immunity. Um, and, and really, so your advanced, your patients with advanced HIV AIDS, and in fact, in the early HIV epidemic, if you look back in the old literature, places, um, you know, like places like Indiana, which is, uh, you know, there's a lot of histo in Indiana, it was the most common opportunistic infection over pneumocystis because it was so common in the environment there. Um, so uh, patients with advanced uh, T cell suppression, whether it be, again, HIV, uh, solid organ stem cell transplant patients, again, the list is the same, 
um, uh, corticosteroids, um, TNF-alpha inhibitors, as we mentioned, really all very important risk factors for disseminated histo. So progressive disseminated histo, so what happens with histo is you, when people who get progressive disseminated histo, they can either get it as a result of reactivation, meaning they were previously in an endemic area and um, and, and, and then it, it, it can lie dormant within um, your uh, within your macrophages, um, and then you can get reactivation, or <clears throat> and, and not only macrophages, but an other lymphoid tissue, like places like the spleen. And hence, you know, you may have seen, um, you know, when you when when you see uh, abdominal films or chest X-rays, and you see calcific. Uh, you, you see calcified areas in the spleen, that's usually old histo. So histo likes the reticuloendothelial system and will hide there um, and be dormant there. And then again, with pr profound immunosuppression can reactivate. Um, but uh, you can also, get, and of course you can get exogenous exposure and being uh, immunocompromised. Um, patients with progressive disseminated histo present much differently. Oftentimes it pre presents, you know, as uh, a patient with constitutional symptoms like fevers, night sweats, weight loss, and then they rapidly uh, emerge into coma, almost like a, a sepsis-like syndrome, often associated with um, respiratory distress and possibly ARDS. Um, but they will often present, uh, you know, in septic shock uh, with, um, uh, with pancytopenia. Again, histo likes the reticular endothelial system, so it in, invades the bone marrow. Um, they will often have liver involvement and they'll have abnormal LFTs. Um, and acute kidney injury, uh, again, multi-system disease. And again, I, they can have a coagulopathy, uh, you know, be, because of, you know, pretty significant release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it can even be associated with an HLH-like syndrome. And I just want to mention, like, you know, for this, this in, within this past year, we've already seen two cases of histo. We saw a case of histo. I, actually, I, 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 it was a case, uh, a clinical vignette that Harrison Winters um, and, and uh, worked on uh, earlier this year. Um, actually, it was a, a, a simultaneous a pancreas kidney transplant who came in with uh, progressive disseminated histoplasmosis, quite ill in the ICU and actually did well um, on ambisome. Um, but uh, she had multi-organ involvement. You know, she had acute kidney injury, her LFTs were abnormal, um, and she had a pretty significant O2 requirement initially and was, was hypotensive when she initially presented. So very much like this patient. And then I know just recently there was another liver transplant patient who came in with uh, not as sick, but came in with uh, a diarrheal-like illness, febrile, and ultimately was found to have uh, histo, but was also a liver transplant patient. So these patients can present uh, quite ill. Um, diagnostically, um, uh, the way to make the diagnosis, the easiest way to make the diagnosis is using, uh, sending off urinary histoplasma antigen or, and serum antigen. Actually, urine histoplasma antigen is more sensitive than the serum. Uh, but um, uh, clearly, if somebody has uh, involvement of the bone marrow, like they have pancytopenia, you can also see histo um, in, in, the, in the bone marrow. So you can do a rapid, if you do a, a bone marrow aspirate, you can see histo there. And sometimes you can even see it um, in the, um, in a peripheral smear on, in blood if you look within the white cells. Uh, but again, we predominantly depend upon the uh, urinary histoplasma antigen to make that diagnosis. Okay. Um, and then treatment, uh, really, uh, probably you're going to give am ambisome initially. And ambisome usually for about maybe one, maybe to two weeks um, until the patients get better. That you know the duration varies, um, but these patients are then can be uh, will then need to be switched to um, itraconazole, the drug of choice. But uh, you know even posaconazole works quite well. Um, and I will just say that the, the important thing about itraconazole is you got to be aware that you have to have an acidic environment, so you got to make sure that they're drinking Coca-Cola or something that's that decreases the pH because it doesn't get absorbed that well. And you really have to monitor itraconazole levels and they need to be on maintenance therapy for months and months and months. Um, probably for transplant patients, you usually out for about one to two years on itraconazole is what's required uh, with close monitoring. Okay. Um, let's go to our next case. Uh, let's see. Oops, I probably, okay. All right, so uh, our next case is um, uh, uh, another patient um, 
who is actually a lumberjack, enjoys walking his dog um, in, in an area near the river. Um, he presents with uh, fevers, a uh, cough, and some skin lesions. Okay, he's otherwise previously healthy. Um, he's noted to have uh, an alveolar infiltrate on his chest X-ray, and um, his skin lesions uh, are look something like that. And um, let's see what the next slide is. So uh, I, I, his initial workup, his sputum is is negative. Uh, you know, it has normal respiratory flora. Uh, but one of the lab techs calls you to come down uh, because they found something very interesting when they were looking over uh, the, uh, the when they were looking over one of the sputum specimens that was sent down. And this is what they saw. And I'm hoping everybody see, recognizes that there's a snowman on the screen right now. Um, so uh, the most likely cause of organism is, all right, and you guys are looking over uh, again. You're seeing broadly based budding yeast. So a lot of bees there. So that's how I like to remember blastomyces dermatitis. Um, and the way I always think, I always think of it, all the bees here. So I, I always think about this disease because it occurs in the sort of upper Midwest, you know, near the rivers. I think of a, you know, uh, I think of a lumberjack working up there and a good name for the lumberjack is Bubba. So Bubba, broadly based budding yeast, and then, um, Blastomyces. That's how I remember it. Okay. So, um, Blastomyces dermatitis, as I mentioned, predominantly occurs in the upper Midwest near the Great Lakes, but actually also follows the same path of, uh, the, um, uh, of histoplasmosis in the central, uh, in this eastern central part of the country, following along the Ohio Mississippi River Valley, and actually also has some pockets up again in the St. Lawrence River Valley too, and upstate New York in that area too. So again, this organism likes more wet soil, you know, remember coxie was in dry alkaline soil uh, out in the Southwest, but this is more wet soil where you have a lot of, uh, you know, decaying vegetation, uh, you know, plant debris and things like that. That's kind of the set setting where blasto grows best. Uh, again, another picture of it. Um, and then this is just uh, to give you an idea of where it is in the United States. In terms of uh, blasto with regard to clinical manifestations, Again, this presents predominantly with pulmonary symptoms. Um, it, and, and again, patients can have pulmonary nodules, they can have dense consolidation, you know, cough, sputum production, um, but it has a high rate of causing um, skin disease. So patients can present with verrucous-like skin lesions um, also. And oftentimes when they do have, um, these verrucous-like skin lesions. So when they, they, they when they when they disseminate to the skin, they will often have um, pulmonary manifestations. So again, for blasto, um, I you know if you see you know somebody who has the right exposure and you see skin lesions and, uh, simultaneous with a pulmonary uh, infiltrate, I would think about blasto. I think that that's that's the take-home message. Um, again, it can go to the bone and joints, and it even can go to the central nervous system. But that's in very immunocompromised uh, patients. Um, diagnosis, again, remember the broadly based budding yeast that you could see on smear within sputum, uh, BAL, um, uh, so, so just, just remember that. And there's also a blastomyces antigen that you can send off in the serum too. And again, I don't think you need to know about treatment, so we're not going to spend time on treatment. I think it's well, I think this is more of a fellow level question, so let's skip this and let's go on to our next case. Let me see how we're doing for time. Okay, I think we can get through this. Um, okay, uh, so um, our next case, uh, this is a, a, a young uh, uh, Asian male with a recent diagnosis of, uh, of uh, advanced HIV disease, CD4 count of 25, high viral load, um, who presents with fevers, um, night sweats, weight loss. Um, again, uh, he, he comes from Vietnam. And he actually uh, is seen in ED, found to be febrile, uh, noted to have some skin lesions, which I'm going to show you right now. 
so he has these skin lesions present. All right. And, um, you know, he's also noted uh, to have um, uh, some hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and, you know, he's, you know he, he, he looks somewhat cachectic. Um, and I think that's, that's all. So this is a little tougher question for you all. But, um, again, I've seen some mix-up questions on it. Uh, so, uh, and, and really, um, what, what we're really asking here is, um, what is the most likely causative agent associated with somebody who has advanced, who has advanced HIV disease from uh, Southeast Asia? And the answer is actually Tauromyces uh, marnefii, which actually uh, formally was known as uh, Penicillium marnefii. And this is actually, this can grow within the blood. These patients can present fungemic and can grow in the blood. And as a yeast form, the classic thing about the yeast form, it actually has these transeptate, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, the yeast is actually kind of cut in half. So you see kind of a line going down the, the middle of the uh, yeast form. So they, they refer to as having tr uh, transeptate, um, uh, appearance. And um, again, so who gets Tauromyces and, and where do we get it? So it really, Tauromyces is, it's like, I would say it's sort of like the histo of Southeast Asia. Um, and again, it's a disease that takes advantage of the predominantly immunocompromised um, and really predominantly HIV patients. And um, it's more common in, you know, in monsoon season, um, and it's acquired from the, the soil, and actually the reservoir is the bamboo rat. Uh, but uh, places like Vietnam, Thailand, um, and other, part, Laos, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia are where this, uh, this um, yeast is uh, endemic, where Tauromyces is endemic. Um, uh, at 25 degrees, it grows as a mold, but and I think at, at you know higher temperatures, at 37 degrees, it grows as the um, the yeast that is characteristic. Again, these transeptate hyphae more probably important for the fellows to know than for you all to know. Um, the uh, the bottom line is uh, this, uh, you know, the clinical manifestations, again, uh, these patients will present with fevers, night sweats, weight loss, but they also can have these characteristic papular nodular skin lesions. Again, they can look umbilicated just like molluscum contagiosum. But again, often a multi-system uh, disease where they develop hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy also. And again, will, uh, you know, if you send off blood cultures, they can oftentimes be fungemic. And uh, one other characteristic of uh, Tauromyces is when it grows, when the mold is growing on a plate, it produces this very pretty red pigment that's shown here. Um, and again, diagnosis, again, as I mentioned, you can culture it from the blood, bone marrow, uh, but, um, and, and, and they also can, you can get it from the lung too. And I forgot to mention these patients also can get, um, you know, diffuse uh, ground glass opacities as well as cavitary lung disease. Um, so again, might be in your same differential when you're thinking about TB, particularly in somebody coming from Southeast Asia. Um, and then finally, um, you know, uh, you, you, you can make the, the diagnosis by, you know, you know again, um, microbiologically. Um, there's some cross-reactivity with galactomannan. You probably don't need to know it, and I really don't think you need to know how to treat. And I'm just going to finish with this one last quick case, because I think this is a good one for the boards. And uh, so this last case is a 35-year-old uh, male uh, veterinarian uh, who presents uh, previously healthy, who presents with skin lesions, um, which I will show you here. So you should be able to see these kind of, uh, uh, this linear distribution of papular nodular skin lesions. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the, the patient, uh, again, is a veterinarian. He's had these lesions for a couple of weeks and uh, his veterinary practice is predominantly with cats and dogs. Okay, so uh, based on this skin finding, again, what's the most likely cause? And you guys are absolutely right. You, 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 you're, you're so good. Sporothrix shankii. So very, very good. You guys are really doing well today. All right. So um, what I, I, I just want to uh, uh, talk about now. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Oh, I skipped ahead. That's what I wanted. Okay. All right. So what I just want to mention real briefly. Um, so you guys are very familiar about Sporothrix, um, Shanky Eye, and I, I, you know, the the. Um, let me just go back one. So this uh, presentation uh, with with this patient. So so again, what what are we looking at? So again, if we just go back and um, look at the, the the question stem. So 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 again, relatively healthy person who presents with skin lesions um, in this kind of uh, linear uh, distribution, um, often in anatomical distribution. This is referred to as lymphocuta lymphocutaneous. Um, uh, or uh, nodular lymph lymphocutaneous uh, disease. So basically, these patients get nodular disease sort of in a lymphatic distribution, okay? And again, there's many different things other than sporothrix that can cause this. So, um, so you classically, this is a sporotrichoid rash, um, and, and this is really probably one of the most recognized causes of nodular lymphangitis. Um, but, and, and, and clearly if I said this patient was pr pruning roses, you would remember that. But I want you to also remember, because I think I've seen board questions on this also, that this is also a zoonotic infection. So sporothrix can be acquired from uh, being exposed to one of my favorite animals, the cat, um, and it can cause, um, again, nodular lymphangitis. But again, depending upon the exposure for your board. So if you if this patient was working on a boat or has a fish tank at home, then the same exact presentation, this nodular lymphangitis, can be seen in patients you know who are exposed to you know uh, again a fish tank or you know uh, you know work working on a boat or something like that. Um, so again, Mycobacterium marinum can cause a similar uh, distribution. Francisella tularensis um, also can do it. Um, so, and you guys all know about the exposure to rabbits, but you know, hunting um, places you at risk for Francisella uh, infections too. So, just just be aware that it can also present again with nodular lymphangitis, and then even um, Leishmania. So, if somebody's from South America and they present with this kind of nodular um, uh, lymphangitis-like presentation, you should also, that should also be in your differential. Again, it depends upon the exposure. And then finally, um, probably less likely for the, for the um, internal medicine people, but more likely for the board, for, for our ID boards, um, Leishmania brasiliensis, um, you can get, I'm sorry, um, not Leishmania brasiliensis, that, that would be in South America, but Nocardia brasiliensis, um, you can get also from exposure to soil too. All right, and I don't think we need to talk about uh, Sporo. Um, there's some more pictures. I think we'll stop there. Uh, and uh, thanks for your attention.